Our speaker is Dr. Peter Marler. Dr. Marler was born in England and received both the Bachelor of Science and the Doctorate degrees in Botany at the University College, the University of London. Not content with that, he went on to a doctorate in zoology from the University of Cambridge, and it is in the field of animal behavior that he's done his most distinguished work. When we think of animals in relation to man, we do not ordinarily think of our fine feathered friends, the birds, but it is to them that Dr. Marler has been led in his quest for understanding communication at its highest subhuman level. It may be of interest to some of you that Dr. Marler began his research in this field under the direction of Professor Thorpe, who was one of our lectures last year, and that he's currently an associate of Dr. Dobshansky of Rockefeller University, another of our lectures last year. We're looking forward with real anticipation to what he has to tell us about animals and man, communication and its development. Again, you are invited to write down the questions that occur to you, and they will be picked up following the lecture for further discussion. Dr. Marler. In uh, uh, deliberating beforehand about the title for this talk, I was tempted to exclude any mention of communication in man. I decided against the change because I do, I do in fact, want to make a few remarks about human communication uh, uh, at the level of some elementary comparisons. My temptation to make the change was provoked because the notion that animal and human communication can be discussed in similar terms seems nonsensical to many people and even offensive. And uh, I'm not anxious to encourage prejudice against what I have to say before starting. If it were more customary to extend our notion of human communication to include not only the spoken and the written word, but also communication by intonation and gesture and expression, then I think most people would agree that there is uh, common ground that can be fruitfully explored in the comparative study of communication. <clears throat> uh, I would insist that I don't believe that the notion of human uniqueness is in any sense demeaned by this uh, attempt at comparison which I shall try to make. Nevertheless, let me begin by trying to establish the point that I am a zoologist and my primary interest is really in trying to understand how animals behave and why. And this is going to be my main orientation through this talk. Uh, to emphasize that a concern with animals is my own primary interest, uh, with a concern which is initially quite remote from human language, I'm going to start with some remarks about communication in insects, which a few people are tempted to anthropomorphize about. <clears throat> There's a simple case which has been the subject of some elegant experimentation to be found among grasshoppers and crickets. There are places in the southeast where you can find as many as 20 species of tree cricket living in the same area, producing sounds, all of which may be audible from a given place. Although the male and the female can produce sounds, most of this din, which you can hear on a summer evening in such areas, comes from the male of these tree crickets, 
in the form of what's known as the calling song. The communicative function of this song is to attract a mate to the male. This attractiveness is easy to demonstrate. You can capture a female who's in reproductive condition and place her in the center of a cage a meter long with a loudspeaker at each end, through one of which you play a recording of the song of a male of her own species and through the other end, the song of a different species. She will unfailingly turn and move towards the speaker from which the sound of her own species comes and even attempt to enter the cone of the speaker. <clears throat> this song functions then in reproductive isolation of the species. And this function carries certain requirements. If females were to respond indiscriminately to the sounds of males of any of the species to be heard in this area, species boundaries would break down. At the very least, time would be lost. At the worst, hybrids would be born that would be adaptively unfit to live in the environments available. Clearly, a mechanism is needed which will restrict her responsiveness to the sounds of males of her species. Nevertheless, there are some refinements which uh, uh, illustrate the kind of problems that arise in an attempt to explore communicative acts in animals such as this. Tree crickets are, of course, cold-blooded, and uh, the rate of many of their metabolic processes will vary with the environmental temperature and this is as true of their songs as of many other of their activities. The pulse rate in the song changes with temperature. Precisely enough that, as I'm sure you know, some of these crickets have earned the name of thermometer crickets. The change in rate with temperature is quite drastic. And one might think that this would throw a female seeking a mate into hopeless confusion. In fact, the physiological mechanism which determines her responsiveness, which is the other side of this communicative coin, the receiving side rather than the sending side, changes with temperature in a precisely parallel fashion. Uh, thus avoiding this potential source of confusion. Now, one might ask, how can you show that it is only the pulse rate to which the female is responding? The quality of the individual syllables of a male song such as this certainly vary from species to species, and it might seem reasonable to suppose that the crickets would be as responsive as we are to these uh, more subtle characteristics of the song. In fact, you can generate an artificial song by an audio oscillator. As long as the pulse rate corresponds to that of the species at the temperature, then a female will respond normally. Thus, the structure of the pulses is irrelevant. Uh, the nicest way of all to demonstrate this is to exploit the temperature dependence of this pulse rate. Suppose that you have the male of one species, species A, who normally sings with a pulse rate of 50 per second, say at 70 degrees centigrade. Now you can take males of another species, species B, whose pulse rate is normally slower than this, then warm him up until his pulse rate matches that of species A, namely a rate of 50 per second, record it, and then play it back to a female of species A, if you're still with me, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And she will respond perfectly, even though you see this is uh, the, the song of species B. Now, I've labored over this example uh, because it really illustrates many, many of the basic points which I think are relevant to any discussion of animal communication. Now, in 
discussion of this material and what I have to say afterwards, I shall refer a good deal to a framework proposed by the distinguished uh, Cornell linguist, Charles Hockett, who, in my opinion, has done more than any other person to advance the methods of tackling the comparative study of communication, if such study is, it, is to include man. And what he's done is to try to redefine the very basic elementary characteristics of language, uh, what he calls uh, design features, in terms which uh, might conceivably permit questions about their presence or absence in animals. Thus, getting around what has for years been the stumbling block in any d attempt to discuss human and animal communication in similar terms, namely the concern with intention or motive. Uh, if you reflect a little, I think it will become obvious that questions of the intention of a person with whom we're speaking are often uh, very difficult to get access to. How very much more difficult it is to make assessments of the, in the intention of an animal. And many discussions of, of, uh, of communication have ended at this point uh, with the conviction that animals show no intent to communicate, therefore there's no language. Hockett suggested that this is an irrelevant issue and that what sh one should really concern oneself with is the more basic characteristics of the language and that it's a requirement that these be defined in terms testable in other species. So he went through and listed some 15 or 20 basic design features which he felt added up to the sum of what language is. And their great value, as I see it, is that most of them are readily testable in animals. Just take a simple example, the requirement of specialization. Are the signals which we observe merely the incidental outcome of some other ongoing activity of the animal? a consequence of the fact that it's moving a limb, say, in uh, uh, feeding or locomotion? Or is there some evidence that uh, equipment of the animal is specialized for the function of producing this signal? It's very clear in these crickets that the design feature of specialization is satisfied. They have special equipment for producing these sounds. This is one of the most elementary of these features. <clears throat> it's a feature which is very widespread in animals, as um, many of these are. Another is arbitrariness, which points out that uh, the relationship between a signal and its referent in the environment should be independent of any physical relationship between the two. Uh, the association between the word for a microphone and its physical attributes is a purely arbitrary one. <clears throat> Again, we can find many examples in the animal kingdom of this arbitrary relationship between signal and referent in the external world. Alarm signals, for example, which these crickets may give uh, when they're suddenly disturbed, have, have no relationship to the cause of, of the danger. And there are many much, much better examples. A third criterion is, is discreteness. The possible messages in the language should constitute a discrete repertoire rather than a continuous one. We don't normally code in our spoken and written language. We don't normally code information in terms of a continuously varying parameter, loudness or pitch. <clears throat> uh, again, discreteness characterizes the uh, communication signals of a great many animals, but uh, including these crickets. But there are 
many other design features which are obviously lacking in crickets. For example, the question of, of traditional transmission. The differences between the conventions in one human language and, and another are transmitted by learned tradition. And one can show very, very readily that this is not the case with crickets. Crickets uh, can easily be deafened by, in some species, removing the forelegs, which is where their ears are placed. And this operation can be performed before the animal is fully mature. When it becomes adult, it will sing a perfectly normal song. Although they can hear and are responsive to what they hear, if they're intact, learning is not necessary for the normal development of their sounds. Now, when we come to consider some other animals, we shall find that this condition of traditional transmission is satisfied, but that other elements among this basic set of design features are lacking. And this is the point which I hope will emerge from this survey, that all or almost all of the basic design features of, of human language are known from at least one other animal group. But nowhere do they all coincide in one organism, as they do in ourselves, so that it's this particular concatenation of features which uh, I suggest has permitted the um, explosive development of language in our own species. <clears throat> now, uh, as something of an aside, the tree cricket example also points up uh, the importance of understanding the particular sensory world in which an animal lives before you can begin to comprehend how its members communicate with one another, uh, which in turn can be used to sustain an argument for the great importance of taking account of what's known of the physiology of an animal before you begin studying its behavior, a consideration in the design of biological uh, teaching curricula. This irrelevance to the crickets of the internal structure of the pulses from which the song is constructed. Is this something that the crickets perceive but choose to ignore? Physiological study shows that although they can hear, they do so in a very different way from us. And one can show that variations of pitch and timbre are virtually imperceptible to them. Their ears are so constructed as to be highly responsive to variations in loudness. And what they hear from one of these songs when it's played to them is the, the pattern of amplitude modulation. Thus, it's not surprising that the internal structure of the pulses is irrelevant because they don't hear it. And this is something that has recurred again and again in the history of uh, study of animal communication. A, misunderstanding consequent upon a lack of appreciation for the fact that each organism has different sets of receptors functioning in different ways and it makes no sense to try to interpret their behavior in human terms. <clears throat> to take another example, many animals are much more responsive than we are to the chemical characteristics of the environment in which they live. Recent studies have revealed a wealth of so-called pheromones by analogy with hormones concerned with chemical communication within the body. Pheromones are chemical signals for communication between organisms. Uh, we know now as a result of work in only the last five years or so that many animals, invertebrate and vertebrate, produce a wealth of these chemical signals from various glands in their body, <clears throat> their 
transmitted in different ways with different diffusion characteristics, serving to lay trails to induce mating, to encourage aggregations for resting, reproduction, to disseminate alarm, uh, to permit recognition of individuals and families and colonies and still larger groups. And once again, it's especially important to understand the characteristics of the receptor system. In this case, the, the, uh, the olfactory receptor system. Before you can begin to make sense of the intrinsic properties of such a system of communication. Uh, let me dwell on just one point. A point which uh, I think would not even occur to you if you approached animal communication solely from the viewpoint of uh, a comparison with human language. We take it more or less for granted that when we're engaged in discourse with someone, contact is already established. Now much of communication in animals is concerned with a, a still more elementary function of establishing contact between individuals. Locatability of the source of a communication signal is vitally important to a great many animals. Uh, understanding of the sensory basis of the animal's behavior is important here because um, the problem of locating the source of a communication signal is very different if that signal is a chemical one than if it's a visual or acoustical signal. A female moth may be able to attract a male of her species from a distance as great as a mile away. However, this is possible only under very special conditions. Imagine an animal yourself in a still medium, air, there's no movement, and there's a source of a chemical signal uh, from which the compound is slowly diffusing out. Your task is to locate the source without any other sensory cues. You may be able to detect the signal anywhere in the room, but to locate it, the only cue available to you is the diffusion gradient. To detect this gradient, it must be steep. And it's only steep enough for you to detect it within a meter or two of the source. And this is as true of a moth as it is of ourselves. This uh, much more dramatic capability uh, of a male moth to home in on a female from a distance as, as much as a mile depends on movement of the medium. There's a wind. The females will only emit this particular signal under the appropriate atmospheric conditions. The male detects it from a great distance. Having detected it, he simply flies upwind until he loses it, and then backs up and tries again. Eventually, he gets close enough to change over from orientation to the wind to orientation to the diffusion gradient, and so he can find her. <clears throat> now, these problems would not arise with a visual signal. In fact, it's difficult to design a set of visual receptors which would not immediately permit both the detection of a visual signal and some idea of the position of its source in space. With sounds, it's a little more complicated, as I'll mention in a moment. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that the different sensory modalities, particularly the distance modalities of vision, audition, and olfaction, each have advantages and disadvantages. Chemical signaling has the great advantage that a mark can be placed on some object in the environment or on the pelage of an animal and will continue to be emitted, can be used to maintain a territory, for example, in a very efficient, uh, efficient way. It's, uh, as effective at night as during the day, and many animals exploit these special advantages. But there are drawbacks too. And so we often find this 
kind of compromise between the choice which an animal makes, I'm speaking teleologically now in an evolutionary sense, the choice made in the course of evolutionary strategy of a species is often a compromise between these advantages and disadvantages of the modalities. Um, one of the most important design features in Hockett's list is that of semanticity. To the extent that communication signals correspond with something in the external world, they, to the extent that they can be said to have a referent, so they have a semantic property. Now, as, as the name for an object has this property of semanticity. Again, we can find examples in the animals, and one of the best comes once more from the insects. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know of the dancing behavior of the honeybee, behavior by which a scout bee, which discovers a food source, uh, flowers which are yielding nectar this morning, returns to the hive and performs what the distinguished German zoologist von Frisch describes as the waggle dance, the, which it, on the vertical face of the dark hive, a little dancing pattern which is observed by other worker bees and communicates to them the distance of the food source, its relative richness, and its direction in relation to the position of the sun. <clears throat> uh, the line of this dance, if you could imagine it magnified now, you see, see here's, here's the worker bee, and let's say uh, food has been found uh, um, directly in line with the sun. Now this scout bee, when he returns, will perform a pattern of movement like this on the surface of the comb. He'll run around in a little tight circle, and then he'll bisect the circle, wiggling his abdomen as he goes, and completes the circle, and back, and so on, like this. If you have an observation hive with a glass side, this is something you can easily observe. <clears throat> this indicates, uh, vertical orientation indicates that the other bees should go towards the sun. And uh, there's ample proof that this is a very effective means of communicating the direction of the food source. The rate of this waggle run is proportional to the distance of the source. The slower the dance, the further the members of the audience must fly in order to find this food source. Mm. And here then is a pattern of signaling behavior with a very specific semantic referent in the external environment. <clears throat> there are other features now which we haven't mentioned yet, also uh, illustrated by this waggle dance. Hockett um, rightly attaches great importance to the feature of, of displacement, this is displacement in time, which requires signaling about events remote in time, either, either in the past or in the future. Now, this is important because most signaling acts that we can observe in animals are very obviously an outcome of immediately present events. And they do not normally signal about events long in the past. It's a question how readily we would detect the fact if they did. Uh, but at least in this one case with the honeybees, we know that this happens. Of course, it happens to some extent every time that a dancing bee signals about a, distance, a distant food source because there is a temporal delay between discovering a new field of clover, flying back to the hive, and then signaling about that source. But uh, 
more detailed study has revealed much longer displacements than this. In fact, you can open a hive at night and occasionally observe dancing that continues. Um, ins the insomniac bee who is still dancing to a food source which he discovered some 10 or 12 hours earlier. <coughs> now, I'm um, trying gradually to work up to some of the more complex and intricate features. And one of these more intricate and perhaps the most important of Hockett's features is that of, of openness, the capacity to coin new messages, to take existing signal elements and to recombine them in meaningful combinations that are comprehended and responded to by other members. The ability, if you like, to employ something like uh, a primitive syntax. And this, of all of uh, Hockett's features, this is the most difficult to identify in animals and perhaps comes the closest to being uniquely human. Now there's a sense in which the honeybee exemplifies the phenomenon of openness. Uh, the life of a worker bee is fairly short-lived and that of its audience may be quite short too. Nevertheless, we can, and, and as a result, there must be many occasions when both signal and audience are engaged in describing a particular uh, distance and direction of a source which neither of them has ever encountered before. Uh, obviously must happen by chance. And yet there's no reason to think that this is anything other than effective as an act of communication. See, they're responsive to a new combination of rate and orientation the first time that it's encountered. At a very elementary level, this illustrates openness in principle, but it's obvious that the limitations are of, of very severe ones. This is a, a point which I'll return to a little later where we may have a more convincing example of openness from chimpanzees. <clears throat> Another point which is not brought out so clearly by Hockett's features is the importance in many animals, as in human language, of the context of the signal. The meaning of a word may be fundamentally affected by the other words with which it's associated. And again, we can find this condition in principle in many animals. This dance of the honeybees can be used to communicate the distance and direction not only of food, but also of water, of resin, and of a new nesting place. Uh, this last function is served by dancing which takes place on the surface of a swarm. As you know, uh, when a, a colony becomes too large, a second queen is produced. She leaves the hive and takes with her a contingent of the workers. They hang up on a tree somewhere. And then for a period of some days, workers will search possible nesting sites. Having discovered one, an individual worker will assess its qualities. It then returns to the swarm and dances on the surface. The angle and rate indicate the distance and direction, and the vigor or persistence of the dance correspond to the worker's assessment of the quality of this particular nest site. At the same moment, there may be three, four, five, even a dozen other bees dancing the attributes of other potential nest sites. And what happens in the course of days here is that the vigor of those individuals who think they found a good source eventually persuades the others 
to their way of thinking. They eventually reach unanimity, and you find that all of the scouts are dancing to the same site with uh, uh, vigor and uh, persistence, and then the swarm takes off and goes to that uh, site and establishes home. <clears throat> Now, remarkable, though, this uh, uh, here, then, you see, is, is a case where the, the context, the dance taking place upon the surface of the swarm rather than in the darkness of the closed hive, results in a rather different behavior from the respondents. The context must be taken into account before the response of the other animals can be understood. Now, remarkable, though, this, this dancing behavior of the bees is, <clears throat> It lacks several of the key Hockett design features, most obviously that of traditional transmission. The honeybee needs no example from older bees uh, in order to develop a perfect pattern of dancing behavior. <clears throat> this can be demonstrated very easily by simply removing all of the older workers from a hive and waiting for new ones to emerge and observing their behavior on their first excursions and returns. They come home with food that they've collected. They dance normally, vivaciously, as Carl von Frisch puts it, and with success. The other workers respond and search out the, uh, the source. <clears throat> Again, you see, it's the concatenation of attributes that's important. Some are present and some are lacking. And given that combination, evolution can go so far and so far and no further. <clears throat> Just one final point again on the bee dance. As always, it's difficult to work out precisely how the receptors of the audience are receiving a signal. And this is one of the major challenges of the science of animal behavior and of sensory physiology, to unravel the, the physiological mechanisms which are responsible for this very fine filtering of incoming stimuli, such that only a certain subclass of the stimuli which can be perceived will get through to a given response. <clears throat> and in the case of the bee dance, we still are not sure just how the audience receives the signal. The hive is dark, the audience cluster around the dancer and often place their antennae on it as it moves around. There may be uh, a direct mechanical transmission of the message here, but it's been recently discovered that a dancer also generates a sound, a train of pulses the duration of the train corresponds with the tempo of the dance, and it may be that the audience responds to this. <clears throat> Only when someone has successfully persuaded honeybees to respond to an artificial dancer in which the various attributes of the dance are independently controlled will we get a final answer to this question. No animal group exploits sounds as a medium for communication more extensively than birds. And it would have been possible to illustrate many of the points that I've made uh, with examples from this group. They, many birds have a large repertoire of sounds serving a variety of functions. And here again, we can often see uh, evidence that the special function that a call has to serve will lead to change in the physical structure of that sound. Uh, let me give just one example of adaptation in the structure of alarm calls, which birds use which again relates to this very elementary function I've already men mentioned of communication signals serving to announce 
or to conceal the position of the signaling animal in space. Consider the problem of locating the source of a sound. Now, vertebrates, and we're fairly typical in this regard, rely for the most part upon a comparison between what is taking place at the two ears. If we hear a sound coming from one side, we locate the source to the right, say. If the sound arrives first at the right ear, if the sound is loudest at the right ear, and if the phase which is perceived at any instant is in advance at the right ear as compared with the left. Now obviously a sound will be most efficiently located if it provides cues for all three of these methods. And one can show that this calls forth modifications in the course of evolution, modifications of the structure of the sound. Localization by phase difference is only possible with very low frequency sounds. Localization by intensity difference is only possible with high frequency sounds because it depends upon the shadow that the head casts in the path of the sound, which the shadow only being significant if the head is big in relation to the wavelength. See, so with high-pitched sounds, you have a striking shadow cast by the head, so that there's a difference in intensity at the two ears. So for phase difference, you need low frequencies. For intensity difference, you need high frequencies. And then for time difference, the sound should incorporate an abrupt beginning or termination or some abrupt discontinuities within the sound, the timing of which can be precisely compared at the two ears. You see the point I'm, I'm getting at is that the, the ideal sound for localization is something like a train of clicks, which give you a wide frequency band and uh, a repeated trains of time cues. And the fact that many acoustical signals of animals, birds included, include as one of their functions that of aiding localization of the animal which is emitting the sound, I think explains the fact that many animal sounds have this kind of repetitive structure with a wide range of frequencies. Now this argument wouldn't be worth advancing were it not for the fact that there is also a converse situation in nature in which it's of some advantage for an animal to be able to emit a sound while uh, concealing its position in space. Uh, uh, for example, uh, small birds living in a woodland may suddenly be confronted with a hawk which is hunting overhead. Now, an animal which emits a lo locatable sound may, it's true, effectively communicate danger to other animals. It may also place itself in mortal danger. And we can see how natural selection might encourage the use of a sound which was hard to locate if this was feasible. And from an understanding of the way in which sounds are located, we can see that such a sound is possible. It would be a sound which is of intermediate frequency, intermediate pitch, too high for phase difference to be used, but too low for any uh, dramatic sound shadow to be cast, and a sound which should not include any time cues. It should be a sound which would begin imperceptibly, then fade to a maximum volume, and then fade out. It would be a long, thin whistle. And this is precisely the structure of the alarm call which many small birds will use in this situation with a hunting hawk flying overhead. <clears throat> this is a case then where the, the 
structure of a communication signal, serving, you see, to disseminate alarm quite effectively, uh, at the same time revealing uh, a minimum of evidence about the location of the signaling animal, this, this set of selection pressures has called forth change in the structure of the signal. Oh. <clears throat> uh, and incidentally, this is a circumstance in which the condition of species specificity, which is so vital if a sound is to function in reprodu reproductive isolation, does not arise. Uh, in fact, it may be a positive disadvantage if species living together used strikingly different alarm calls because it would hinder what we know is actually to occur in nature, which is interspecific communication. In the context of alarm, provided that species are endangered by the same predators, there's a positive advantage in using similar calls to minimize species differences, as we can observe in, in this alarm call. Well, uh, there is one design feature which is peculiarly well exemplified by birds and found nowhere else in the animal kingdom other than man. And that is in the traditional transmission of vocalizations. If you were setting out to explore the subject of vocal imitation, it might seem logical to begin by looking at the capacities of monkeys and apes in this regard. Although it's true that uh, chim two chimpanzees and an orangutan have uh, been persuaded to utter a couple of words as a chimpanzee, Vicky, who was trained at great labor to say cup, cup, and mama, and papa. They were her three words. It's clear that the process by which these were uh, introduced into the behavioral repertoire were entirely different than those which, which generate speech. Uh, primates, apparently, other than man, have no facility at all for vocal imitation. But some birds do, and uh, I'd like to suggest that the comparison between the processes involved in traditional transmission in bird vocalizations and in speech development may be of some interest. This is a question we can explore in birds by raising them in social isolation. We take them from nature, raise them in the laboratory, away from their own kind, study their development under such conditions, and then we expose other subjects to various kinds of social acoustical conditions to see what the impact of these conditions may be on vocal development. There are some birds in which social isolation has no effect on vocal development at all. This is true of, of chickens, obviously. It's true of doves. In fact, you can even deafen a dove a few days after hatching so that it is not only unable to hear other doves, it can't even hear its own voice, and it will develop a normal vocal repertoire. But there are a lot of birds in which this is by no means true, especially songbirds. And I'd like to give an example of one in which we've, uh, which we've studied in some detail, which is the white-crowned sparrow, um, which we looked at in, in California. If you take young males from the nest and raise them either in individual isolation, in a, an acoustical chamber by themselves, or in isolation as a group, you find that they will begin singing more or less on normal schedule, vigorously, but that when you record the sounds and subject them to spectrographic analysis, their structure proves to be highly abnormal, unlike anything which you could record in nature. <clears throat> so the class of sounds produced by birds raised under these isolated conditions fall quite outside 
the natural patterns. <clears throat> now, if uh, instead you bring them into the laboratory, and sometime during the first month and a half of life, between 10 and 50 days of age, you play to them a recording, eight or 10 minutes a day, of a wild male song, they will subsequently come into song, a normal schedule, and will produce an imitation of that song to which they were exposed. Uh, let me make this point a little more effectively with a couple of slides. <clears throat> One point I should mention, uh, we've lost our, here's our projectionist, yeah. Uh, the clue that learning might be involved in song development in birds such as this comes from the fact that, just as in our own speech, there are dialects in the natural songs of male white crowned sparrows. So that in California, for example, you can identify with fair accuracy the area in which a given recording is made. The first slide, please. <clears throat> I've attempted to portray this in a little sketch map here, which is probably hard for you to see, of the San Francisco Bay Area with examples of the songs of six males from each of three areas uh, presented as sound spectrograms. These are displays which you read from left to right as you, as you would read a score with pitch or frequency on the vertical scale from low to high, and with time along this axis, these songs being about two seconds in duration. Now, if you look closely at the structure of the syllables from which these songs are produced, you can see that there are clear local differences. <clears throat> Birds in Marin County have this kind of structure here. Birds in Berkeley have this sort of structure with a very <laughs> surprisingly this is the more flamboyant of the two <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you go a hundred miles south of San Francisco you find the, uh, yet a different area now you see the method here is to take a young bird remove it from its natural environment and then to compare the vocalizations it produces with a good prediction of what would have happened if you had left it to develop under natural conditions. The substrate for this comparison is always the natural dialect. The next slide, please. <clears throat> now, if you would just concentrate on these two displays at the top here, A1 and A2. These are examples of songs produced by males who were raised in strict social isolation from the age of about five days. Uh, they uh, represent patterns which one simply cannot find in nature. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Now, you do the same kind of experiment and raise the birds in a group rather than in individual isolation, which one might think would impose some correction on the developmental process, since they normally do have companions in their youth, you still find that the patterns are quite abnormal. The point is emphasized here by arranging these songs of these nine birds who were all in a single group in a large acoustical chamber, um, arranging the displays according to the areas from which they came. These three, A1, A2, A3, came from an area where this was the typical dialect. B1 and B2 came from south of San Francisco where this was the typical pattern. Now these four, C1 through four, came from um, Inspiration Point, which is just to the north of Berkeley, as identified by this song. See, no sign 
of the particular local dialects is manifest in their songs. <clears throat> Nevertheless, there is some suggestion of normal structure in the use of these pure tones. And if you play a recording of one of these songs to an ornithologist, a field ornithologist, he'll listen and be puzzled, and then he'll say, well, it sounds like a species of Zonotrichia, which is the genus uh, including the white-crowned sparrow, but it must be a species that I've never heard. There is some normalcy in the tonal quality of these whistles, which is a point I'll come back to in a moment. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> we do the critical experiment of raising the birds in similar chambers, but with an opportunity to listen to a normal song in this critical period between 10 and 50 days of age, and we find that normal development occurs. Uh, in this slide, some of the developmental stages in these two individuals, A and B, are shown, and you can see here how over a period of months the song gradually develops and eventually produces a, a fair copy of the uh, syllabic structure of the particular song with which the bird was trained, which is this one over the top left, 81. And look particularly at the structure of these syllables here and these here, which is manifest in both of these birds. Neither of them produced a good imitation of this buzz at the end. Uh, for what reason, I don't know. But the point remains that by this simple treatment of playing back song for, uh, in this case, only eight minutes a day, suffice to restore normal development. Now, the point I want to try to make here is that there are some intriguing parallels with speech development. They're all, of course, elementary, and you may find them even offensive, but let, let me suggest that um, they're, they're worth dwelling on for a moment. In each case, in the child and these birds, we have a pattern of vocal behavior the development of which is strikingly affected by what the organism hears in its youth. The sounds are learned. In both cases, this learning results in local dialects. <coughs> now, recent theorists, um, prominent among whom are, are Dr. Lenneberg and Do Dr. Chomsky, have drawn attention to the need to invoke some very special predispositions that the child brings to the task of language development if we are to understand what takes place as it begins to acquire speech. Predispositions to develop uh, a particular kind of syntax and so on. Now, there are senses in which a white-crowned sparrow, too, brings to the task of song learning some striking predispositions. Uh, they're manifest, in this case, for example, in a much greater readiness to imitate a song of a member of the species than the song of a close relative. And in fact, this kind of experiment displayed here was a little more complex than I have suggested in that these two birds were actually given a choice between a recording of their own song and the recording of an alien species. In each case, uh, see, in, in this case, was the song of another member of the genus Zonotrichia, the Harris's sparrow. In this case, it was the song of a song sparrow. Uh, both were rejected, and attention was focused on the conspecific song. The next slide, please. <clears throat> now, you take this experiment still further, and during this period, when you know <coughs> the potential for learning to exist, you expose only to the song of an alien species. Here are three birds which were given recordings of song sparrow song during this critical period. It had no visible impact on development at all. They developed as though they had been raised in acoustical isolation. <clears throat> so 
notwithstanding the fact that the young male cannot produce a normal song, it seems to possess some mechanism by which attention is focused on an appropriate class of the sounds to which it's exposed in nature. It's in this sense that I see predispositions brought to, to the, um, the undertaking here. <clears throat> uh, and we perhaps should mention the point which is often taken completely for granted, that children too are at a very early age responsive to the particular class of sounds that human speech represents. And you don't find them attending and attempting to imitate with the same industry um, sounds which they may hear from a musical instrument, for example. It's so elementary that we overlook the fact that the child, too, uh, has perhaps some mechanism for focusing on conspecific sounds. Now, uh, let me just suggest a further parallel that intrigues me here in the role of the ab ability of the organism to hear its own voice. We know that in speech development, a child which is born deaf has great difficulty in developing speech, as everyone knows. However, if deafness occurs at a somewhat later age, after the first rudiments of speech are established, then much more normal speech can be sustained. And an adult person suffering deafness can speak quite well. Um, we find essentially the same relationship in these birds. If you deafen a white crowned sparrow before it has begun to sing, it will produce a sound which is still more elementary than any which is produced by an, an intact bird, even if it's raised in social isolation. You get a sound which is almost insect-like. The next slide, please. A series of uh, um, irregular, uh, almost click-like sounds with a wide range of frequencies, <clears throat> varying from one song to another. Lacking even those few normal traits which you can observe in the song of an intact, isolated bird. But now, if you, the next slide please, finally, you postpone this uh, operation until after song development is complete, as you see in this slide from the work of my associate, Dr. Konishi at Princeton, uh, singing behavior is sustained quite normally. A bird is singing, you deafen by removing the cochlea on each side, and a day after the operation, you can record his singing, and it's, it's normal. Only in the course of months is there some gradual drift away from the original pattern, and even then, it never reverts to the primitive pattern of a bird deafened before singing. Thank you. Lights, please. So. See, there's a, an analogy here in the role of hearing. Um, and we interpret this set of experiments as implying the existence in the young male bird of a mechanism somewhere in its auditory machinery, somewhere in the auditory pathway, which functions as a kind of template a template which is initially crude, but sufficient to focus the bird's attention upon the class of sounds represented by the song of males of its species. In its youth, it listens attentively to such sounds. In doing so, the properties of this template become more refined, and they specify normal song and the particular dialect to which the bird has been exposed. And then the voice is subsequently matched to this so-called template, and we achieve normal development. If it's raised in isolation, but is allowed to hear itself, then instead it matches its voice to this primitive template alone, which specifies some normal characteristics of 
uh, frequency and tone, and no more. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, you get the same outcome from this deafening experiment before singing. If you do the operation before or after training, so the deafening makes the consequences of training inaccessible to the bird. It can no longer refer to the memory of what has been heard in the process of song development. Uh, perhaps something analogous occurs in speech development too. Well, I, I don't mean t t to labor this point too much, but let me just go quickly again through these parallels. The fact that acoustical experience plays a prominent role in vocal development in the child and in these birds. The fact that it generates dialects in each case. The fact that there are special predispositions brought to the learning process. The existence of critical periods in the life. Um, the song of one of these birds remains fixed once the motor pattern is crystallized, irrespective of what further auditory experience the bird may have. Even if its song is highly abnormal, you can place it in an aviary over which there are wild males singing normal song. There will be no further change. So there are critical periods in each case. <clears throat> in each case, there's some evidence that uh, at least some of the production of imitation is, uh, in a sense, self-reinforcing. It does not require reward by food or reward by social approbation of a parent in order for learning to occur. And uh, I gather that there are students of language development who feel inclined to invoke this notion there too, as is clearly the case with these birds, which will learn simply from a sound coming to them through a, through a loudspeaker with no extrinsic social reinforcement at all. Uh, there are these parallels I've suggested in the role of hearing. And finally, there are some parallels between subsong and the babbling stage of speech development. Well, suppose at least you accept these suggestions in principle. Does this mean that we've discovered speech in birds? Obviously not. I believe that these parallels are simply the manifestation of a basic set of rules that any system of vocal imitation is likely to evolve if it's to function effectively in a natural environment, effectively and efficiently. And this is as true of our own language, which has a biological history, just as the song of these birds has a biological history. The difference lies not simply in the ability to perform this kind of vocal imitation, but in the use to which we put this capacity. This then is the point to which I return again. We don't observe language in these birds because of the lack of some of the other design features. And um, we're reminded again that our uniqueness is to be found in the particular combination that we possess. <clears throat> the consequences are in fact quite different in these birds, vocal imitu imitation is used to actually to reduce the complexity of the vocal behavior within a population. And uh, the striking consequence is the homogeneity. And there are reasons to think that it functions actually to encourage young males and females to return to breed in the area in which they were born, perhaps um, encouraging a low level of inbreeding in local populations and perhaps permitting some kind of physiological uh, adaptation to local conditions. It's an entirely different consequence than the ability which we possess. Uh, it's out of this conviction that I even have the temerity to suggest these parallels. <clears throat> um, now, 
tradition then is uh, a criterion which is satisfied by other animals. And there are many examples. The one criterion which it is very difficult to discover in animals is this capacity to use something like a meaningful syntax. And I'm tempted to think that more than any other single criterion, it's this one which, uh, which is the, the Rubicon that must be crossed before language can evolve. Now, in conclusion, it's intriguing to look again at what we know of communication in other primates. Surely there must be some clues to be found from the study of monkeys and apes that might prepare us for the explanation of uh, the evolution of, of human language. And on the whole, um, this kind of uh, revelation has been very difficult to come by. The summer before last, we had an opportunity to study the behavior of chimpanzees in the field with a woman, Dr. Jane Van Lawick Goodall, who has done more than anyone else to expand our understanding of the natural behavior of chimpanzees. And we studied the vocalizations. Uh, we found them of interest, but I shan't dwell on them now because um, they illustrate no new principle. It seems to me that the vocalizations of chimpanzees have the same kind of attributes which one can observe in other social animals, particularly social primates. But there's no particular sign of anything unique there. One striking thing, though, is the rich use of gestures and expressions in the communication of chimpanzees. <clears throat> Let me just keep you for a moment longer to show you a couple of slides um, illustrating the kind of uh, thing I have in mind. Thank you. <clears throat> if you look at the facial expressions used by uh, non-human primates during communication, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, you can find there's some regularity in the patterns employed. There are three basic facial expressions which primates use. There's a threat gesture, which you see illustrated here in a monkey uh, with the corners of the mouth drawn forward, no display of the teeth, uh, a lunging movement of the hand, a gesture that recurs very widely in primates studied so far. It's described as something like an open mouth threat, an open jawed threat, so on. Note that the teeth are not particularly displayed. The next slide, please. Now, the converse expression, which you may observe in the subordinate animal in an aggressive encounter, an animal that is prone to withdraw, is a grin, uh, an expression which is physically uh, reminiscent of our own smiling behavior. This, too, is very widespread. And then the third um, um, node, as it were, which one can see in this very variable set of facial expressions the next slide, please, emerges as something like the lip-smacking behavior, which you can see here in this macaque, which is advancing towards another, preparing for a peaceful encounter with it, and in doing so, is rapidly moving its lips and making a sound, like this. <clears throat> this is more variable than the other two. But the pattern recurs. In some cases, the tongue is moved within the um, lips. And it seems clear that this, you have one set concerned with um, uh, aggressive activities, another with escape activities and submission, and this third set here with um, uh, the introduction of peaceful social interaction. Now, I've presented these just to, uh, as a framework within which to present a few photographs of these wild chimpanzees. The first slide, please. Now, <clears throat> uh, this is the, an adult male chimpanzee, the alpha male in the group which we studied, Mike, who is threatening towards my microphone. 
And this is as far as chimpanzees go uh, towards generating the equivalent of an open mouth threat. This expression is, is muted. Next slide, please. We do see one interesting thing, which is the tendency to employ the hand as an accompaniment to this gesture. There is a sound, too. <coughs> That. You see this swiping movement with the hand. So this close range aggressive gesture is muted and instead there's another component, a display, which the males perform, which is a highly ritualized activity, uh, which we don't see in other primates. So here then is some suggestion of change in the chimpanzee, which is of course the, the closest surviving relative that we have. Next slide please. Now again, we can observe the grin in the chimpanzees, um, which is shown here in animals which are terrified of their own reflection in a mirror. <clears throat> <laughs> here too, there are some differences with other primates in the broad array of contexts in which this uh, expression can occur. Uh, th th there are, as with all of these, of course, there are many subtle gradations. Uh, next slide, please. This expression can take a more extreme form here in an adolescent male who is terrified of the aggressive display of a higher ranking male. And here again, as in many of these cases, there's an accompanying sound. And sounds and gestures are used very much in concert. He's screaming loudly. <clears throat> I won't inflict an imitation on you, <laughs> <clears throat> unless someone likes to request it. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Now, one of many interesting trains of thought that uh, is generated by this study is the relationship between laughter in ourselves and laughter in the chimpanzee. This is the expression of an infant male who is laughing <laughs> Sound like that? In response, in response to the tickling by his mother. Here, on her hand. It's a very clearly defined and easily identifiable pattern of behavior, which is, as we see from the physical analysis of the sounds used, is, uh, I think, unquestionably uh, related to human laughter. The interesting thing is that in the chimpanzee, the expression associated with laughter is quite divorced from the grin. They're, they're separate in context and separate in physical structure. And it seems that one of the things that has occurred in the history of our own visual communication signaling is the incorporation of laughter with an expression which in other primates and in the chimpanzee is clearly associated with fear, even terror, and a tendency to withdraw. <clears throat> the next slide, please. This is a, another example of the same expression, uh, another infant male. This is laughter, and you see the, although the teeth may be visible, you don't get this contraction of the m muscle in, in the cheek. Uh, which draws back the corner of the mouth, as occurs in the fear grin of a chimpanzee, and as occurs in our own smiling. See this? It's not drawn back. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Uh, uh, finally, what's become of this lip smacking gesture? Uh, here is an adult male who is lip smacking during grooming which is obviously the origin for lip smacking in primates in general, an introduction to grooming, which is very common in primates, um, is an important social activity uh, serving to generate and sustain close contact to reduce the arousal level in uh, interacting animals, and as we see in lip smacking, to introduce other peaceful exchanges that require proximity. In chimpanzees, this is a, a very little used and ill-defined gesture. Instead, we find a whole series of other gestures um, 
which uh, perform this same kind of context of introducing peaceful interaction between animals, greetings behavior, reassurance behavior, if you like. The next, please. And uh, this is one such, a bobbing pattern, which you can observe in the male. The main point I want to emphasize here is the remarkable use of the hands in exchanges such as this. The next slide, please. <clears throat> here you see an adolescent male, again terrified by the reflection in the mirror, extending a hand to an adult male and placing it within his mouth, uh, an exchange which for a moment seems to pacify the uh, adolescent male it provides him with reassurance. The next, please. There's a whole set of, of such exchanges. Here you see an adult female with her infant female here. And uh, this is Circe and Cindy, and this is Flint, uh, a infant male who is um, very prone to engage in play with other infants. Immediately before this picture, he was engaged in vigorous play with the infant, it became too rough. This female is very protective. She extended a hand and just clumped the other infant male away. He bowled over, screamed, returned to within, within arm's length, screaming, and she extends her hand with the back of the fingers towards him. He kisses the hand, holding his face against her hand for the moment, and then they relax and play is resumed. Another kind of reassurance gesture, which once more involves the hand. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is another, a very curious one, between two adult males here, in which one male, they're both nervous. Uh, this is, again, part of this mirror experiment. One male places his hand in the groin of the other. And apparently, this, too, is an exchange which provides some level of mutual reassurance. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Finally, there's this type of exchange in which you have three, three animals here. This is the lowest ranking, this is the next, and this is the alpha male. This one is terrified, reaches its hand out across the other, screaming. The second male responds, extends his hand, and for a moment will pat the palm of the others with his. And again, for a moment, they relax and are reassured. The next, please. <clears throat> Finally, there's another ubiquitous hand gesture of, of begging here. Uh, this is a female begging for food from an adult male. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you. The lights, please. This use of the hands is, of course, not surprising uh, when we acknowledge the uh, extensive development of manual skills in uh, chimpanzees. I mention it now because it serves to introduce my final point. In seeking for parallels between processes of communication in chimpanzees and man, the attempts to train chimpanzees to speak were unsuccessful. Very recently, there's been another approach tried to this problem, which is, being, which is very successful, and which stems from an appreciation of the extent to which wild chimpanzees make use of their hands. The uh, a research team, the gardeners at the University of Nevada in Reno, reasoned that Perhaps the inability of chimpanzees to imitate speech is not really a reflection of any gross inadequacy of their intelligence, but a consequence of some much more specific block to vocal imitation. And one might stand a chance of success by attempting to train them through some other modality making use of a set of signals which they already employ in an unusually rich fashion. So they and their assistants 
taught themselves the sign language, the American sign language of the deaf. They got a young female chimpanzee, and in her presence, speech is forbidden, and they engage in all of their discourse by means of the sign language. <clears throat> Most of the training to which this animal is exposed comes in that fashion. As a non-participant observer, much, again they reasoned, much as a child gets much of its exposure to human speech as an observer of discourse between other individuals. They also engage in some more restricted training sessions. And the progress is, in, in my opinion, remarkable enough to be worthy of comment. This chimpanzee is now responding appropriately to more than 50 gestures and is herself generating something of the order of 30 or more. Um, she has very clearly shown uh, an ability to deal with one of the first problems in generating a language, which is to generalize from the particular object to which she was trained to others, so that, for example, you can sit her down with a picture book and turn the pages, and she will sign a dog cat, turn the page again, a flower, a hat, and so on, responding appropriately to pictures that she is seeing for the first time. Well, most exciting of all, although still by no means proven, is the possibility that this animal may be showing the first signs of an ability to use syntax. Uh, for example, last September when I made a, a, a visit to Reno, uh, I was taken out into the garden where this chimpanzee is kept, and she took me by the hand and led me to the door of a garage in which she's accustomed to play. <clears throat> and the door was locked, so she turned to me and made the gesture, I'm not really very good at rendering these gestures, so don't quote me, but <laughs> the, she, she turned to me and gave the, the come give me gesture, which is this, hurry, come give me the key to open the door, which is sort of a sentence, and I think is very exciting. Uh, still, you see, the question remains as to the novelty of this sequence of signs which the animal is producing. It's in the very nature of this project that this chimpanzee is constantly exposed, not only to single signs, but to sequences. And it may be that all she's doing, really, is imitating larger fragments. And this is not sufficient to satisfy the kind of criterion that we have in mind. She must demonstrate some ability to generate a novel combination implying a sufficient comprehension of the meaning of the signs that they can be put together to generate a new message. And this uh, will be difficult to get firm evidence on from this project for, I think, the very same reasons which make the project so successful, this rather relaxed attitude they take to the training, which I suggest is the kind of attitude a parent has to speech development in uh, its children. The conclusion I suggest then is that <clears throat> these basic attributes of language broken down into design features are to be found throughout the animal kingdom with the possible exception of openness. And what is distinctive about our own language is the particular combination of abilities. And the problem then becomes to explain why this particular set evolved in us and not in any other animal. Because surely the stage must have been set many times for this same evolutionary step. I don't believe it's attributable to some abstract notion of high intelligence. Uh, rather, I think the ultimate explanations are to be found somewhere in the ecology and social organization of early man. 
the critical step here, I suggest, was the evolution of a society within which the impact of language could make its effect felt. Had that kind of society been evolved in other animals than our progenitors, I suggest that they too might have evolved a language. And thus, I suggest the next step in this exploration of language history uh, has to be made by the anthropologists, the archaeologists, and the ecologists. Thank you. Thank you.